Happiness at work is at a four-year low according to many recent studies. Furthermore, the rise in unfortunate incidents related to work-induced stress among employees has intensified the call for organizations to take concrete actions to safeguard the mental, physical and emotional well-being of their people. With this pressing issue in mind, we are recording a very special episode of The Learning Curve today. My guest, joining me in person and in front of a live audience is Dr. Raj Raghunathan, who has been championing the cause of employee happiness and fulfillment at work for more than a decade. Dr. Raj is the author of the acclaimed book, If You're So Smart, Why Aren't You Happy? Without much further ado, I welcome to the podcast, Dr. Raj Raghunathan. delighted to have Dr. Raj here. A little bit about him. He is an expert on happiness and uh, his course on <coughs> happiness for the longest time uh, was the number one course on that uh, platform. And one interesting trivia about him, he had a chance to meet uh, Shah Rukh Khan uh, when he visited India and he was on stage. And the interaction, I have not seen that video, but uh, apparently the interaction went something like this. They were introducing themselves and uh, Raj was like, my name is Raj. <laughs> right, so, so without much further ado, Raj, can we have you, you on stage? Thank, thank you. Thank you. So we will start with the easy questions first, right? <laughs> um, if you could choose one happiness superpower that you could give to every CHRO in the room, CLO in the room, what would it be? W one of the things about happiness is that I think that it's easier to kind of focus on other people's happiness and enhance other people's happiness if you're happy yourself. Um, and so the superpower that I would give to CHROs is to make them really happy people. <laughs> right? And if they're really happy, then I think it's easier for them to address the unhappiness or problems that other people might have. And so the question is, then maybe, you know, how do you increase the happiness of CHROs, right? And that's a question perhaps I'll answer to, in response to another question that is, is coming up later. Okay, mm -hmm. awesome. So, um, you, you've done a lot of research on happiness and when it comes to happiness, I think we all understand what the concept is. We, we perhaps living through it or living through unhappiness, whatever the case may be. Um, but you, you also scientifically looked at this uh, yeah. topic, right? Uh, can you discuss any counterintuitive findings you found in your research where attempts to increase happiness uh, actually backfired? Yeah, so it's not directly my own research, but uh, other people have found that, and it's interesting that you, your TED talk was titled The Pursuit of Happiness. So there, is, there are some papers that show that if you pursue happiness too directly, then it actually backfires and it actually lowers your happiness levels. And one of the reasons for this is that when you set up a goal, um, there is a goal monitoring process that immediately gets triggered. So if you want to lose weight uh, and it's a very salient goal for you, then uh, you're going to assess how far or how close to the goal you are right now. So if you really want to lose 10 pounds, then you might measure using a weighing scale where you are. Um, and so this process is called goal monitoring and it's useful usually. Uh, so if you want to save enough money for retirement, then assessing where you are compared to where you want to be is useful, right? Because it then tells you what you need to do in order to achieve the goal or close the gap. But with happiness, what happens with the goal monitoring process is that if you're constantly kind of looking at the discrepancy between where you are and where you want to be, and where you want to be is obviously likely to be somewhat lofty uh, because, you know, we all aspire to achieve something we don't have. So you're going to come up short compared to where you want to be and so that is then going to make you somewhat unhappy. So you're going to be unhappy about the fact that you're unhappy, so to speak. So the pursuit of happiness is not very good uh, and it turns out that if you actually look at this kind of ironic effect it's called, where when you set up a goal it actually makes it less likely you achieve the goal, um, happens with some other goals too, uh, like sleep, right? I'm actually somewhat sleep deprived. Uh, I came from the US about a week ago, but somehow I'm not able to get rid of the jet lag. And uh, so I kind of, it's kind of salient to me right now that I'm really very keen on falling asleep. And um, 
I don't know if you can um, uh, relate to this, but when you're very keen to fall asleep, it actually kind of makes it more difficult to fall asleep, right? So last night I was just lying in bed and I was thinking to myself, then I almost fell asleep. You know? <laughs> um, it turns out that love is also like that. It's a bit of an ironic goal. If you were too keen to attract love into your life, right? um, it actually tends to backfire. You need to be somewhat chilled out about it. Um, and in particular, if you're very keen on pursuing a particular person, then they might even find you somewhat creepy, you know? Uh, and there is something to be said for being a little bit difficult to get uh, in order for you to enhance the chances that the, that the other person finds you attractive. So there's a few goals that are kind of called ironic goals and happiness is one of them. And so that would be a somewhat, I guess, counterintuitive finding that if you're too keen. So one of the things that I talk about is that, you know, I think you need to prioritize happiness but not pursue it. Prioritize sleep, but not pursue it. So what that then means is that there's much more focus on the processes that lead to the outcome, you know, going back to the yep. atomic habits, uh, rather than on the outcomes itself. So what does it mean to prioritize happiness? It means that the things that reliably make me happier, I'm going to try and do those things a little bit more. I'm not going to spend a lot of time monitoring and measuring uh, whether I'm, I've arrived, basically. Right. So does the it make smart, sense? yeah, it does. Uh, so the smart watch, where we, we tend to track some of these things, yeah. do you find that it becomes sort of counterintuitive or well, counterproductive? Yeah. So with the smart watch, I think the kinds of things that it tracks are okay. You know, so for example, the number of steps that you take in a day, or you know, if you've stood up at least one minute every twelve for twelve, or whatever. You know, those are the things that I have on my watch at least. Those are fine. Those are not ironic goals. But if it were to track your happiness levels and your mood then I think that it might actually be counterproductive. Right. So I, I happened to watch this video by Jensen Huang, the CEO of uh, NVIDIA. And um, I'm sure you've seen this, where he wishes suffering for every people, <laughs> uh, everyone, uh, in their path towards success. You know, he wishes for suffering, right? I thought it was uh, an interesting perspective. So, you know, I'm going off script here, yep. but what, what does that mean in terms of uh, happiness no, not being a direct goal mm -hmm. and it is okay to suffer through a period of time before we can achieve. Is that paradigm more uh, related to success than happiness? Any perspectives on that? Uh, so, I think there is a way in which you can kind of think of happiness as a state in which you would rather not be somewhere else doing something else. Right? If you define happiness that way, and if you kind of aspire to be in that headspace, where regardless of what's going on, you are there in the moment, you'd rather not be somewhere else doing something else, then it's possible to be happy in that way, that you know, there's an alignment with, like you were talking about the authentic self. Yeah. There's an alignment with, and a comfort and a sense of acceptance with whatever it is. And um, there's an element of obviously working toward it, you know, once you have that as a goal that you want for yourself. And I do think that it is a uh, desirable goal because we don't control outcomes often, right? And if you can be happy or you can be uh, in a state where you'd rather not change anything um, and you're accepting of the, uh, the experience as it's happening, then obviously then you're by definition going to be happy all through, right? Um, so, uh, in that sense, I, I do think that this idea of suffering is not antithetical to happiness because if you accept suffering as another state that you perhaps don't have control over or you might even invite it, right? Because in some ways, if you set lofty goals and if you, stretch, if you set stretch goals for yourself, then I don't know if it's quote unquote suffering, but there's certainly pain involved, <laughs> right? And there is certainly hard work involved. There is certainly an element of... Um, discomfort um, and uncertainty and perhaps stress and anxiety etc but you've developed the ability to uh, you know treat that as even those experiences as ones in which you would rather not be somewhere else doing something else okay. then it's possible to be happy too so obviously for success that's very important right because the way that you achieve lofty goals is by pushing yourself there's no doubt about it, right? I mean, there's just a lot of research on it. There's a very good book called Peak by Anders Ericsson who talks about peak performance and what it takes. And if you look at the people who have achieved a lot, 
uh, they push themselves. Um, not by too much, right? They're intelligent about what kind of things they want to achieve. Um, and it's only a little bit, uh, there's a delta that's not too high from where they are to where they, where they want to be, but they definitely push themselves. So there is an element of stress or anxiety and discomfort um, for achieving success, but it is not necessarily antithetical to happiness in the way that I choose to define it at least. Yeah, I, I love the definition by the yeah. way, that's awesome. Now shifting gears a little bit, uh, because we are operating in a corporate context, right? Yeah. Uh, so what does happiness mean in the workplace? I'm sure anytime you speak about things like this, it needs to be attached to a financial metric. What mm -hmm. is the ROI of that? Yeah. Becomes uh, a, a central question. So any uh, point of view on that, how do you calculate the ROI of happiness in the workplace? Is it even possible? It, it is possible. Um, I think the way to do it though is somewhat difficult, but I think it is really worth doing it. Uh, I'm a researcher, I'm an academic, so my approach is to kind of tackle this question using the academic lens. So what I would do is I would measure happiness before any interventions were introduced. So for example, um, you have this wonderful organization here and it seems like it's already happy, but let's say that you aspire for even more happiness, um, then you might introduce some interventions and it could be something like, okay, let's have mindfulness classes, right, or sessions. Or you might say that, well, you know, maybe uh, we should have everybody do a little kind of workout um, just before uh, they come into, um, uh, come into work in the morning, right? And so you might kind of like even uh, maybe um, give out to your employees a free gym membership, for example. So whatever the intervention is, so you'd measure happiness first and then have the intervention and then measure uh, the happiness levels after the intervention. So this is as far as the happiness enhancement goes, right? But really your question is more about ROI. So if the happiness does increase, does it increase ROI, right? And so then what I would do is measure things that are related to ROI. I would measure things like the productivity of these employees um, um, that experience this intervention. So uh, what I would also have is a control group. So I would have an equal number perhaps of employees that uh, were not introduced to the intervention um, because happiness sometimes can change just by seasonality, right? Yeah. So uh, then I would compare the happiness levels of the people in the intervention group with the people in the non-intervention group and then look at their levels of productivity um, and then to the extent that you can connect the productivity levels to uh, profits or financial metrics, I would do that. Um, this perhaps doesn't sound like a you know sexy answer but I think this is the only way in which you can be sure that it's actually working, right? Yeah. Because anything else that you do is not going to be a controlled, uh, what we call a randomized controlled trial study. And yeah. that's the gold standard that you want to kind of aspire for. Yeah. So a follow-up question to that, right? So there are different terms that are used in a corporate context. It could be employee engagement. It's right. something that right. goes out as a survey and people yeah. fill it out. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, well-being initiatives, right? Which right. is a little bit more structured in terms of financial well-being, social well-being, then there's some construct around it. And then there is happiness, yeah. right? So what, what should the organization actually be measuring? Is it <laughs> engagement, well-being, happiness, how are they all related? Mm -hmm. I would say why not measure all of them, right? I mean, at some point you have to kind of draw the line and say, you know, it's too many things that we're trying to measure. But I think happiness is so fundamental. And most, you know, so let's just see, just by a show of hands, how many of you aspire to be happy? Okay, <laughs> would like to be happy. Right? So everybody, you know, really, I mean, around the world, there's no one, uh, I think, or very, very few people who would say that that's not something that I aspire for or that's not something that I want. It's so fundamental to us that everybody wants it. And um, it turns out that it actually drives all these other things. So happiness is where it starts. So if you, again, go back to that, you know, atomic habits picture that you mentioned, right? I mean, at the very center is your identity. Yep. Right. So in a similar way, I think the very, at the very center, the core of what people want is happiness. And if they're happy, then engagement and morale and satisfaction and therefore productivity, all of them follow as consequences. Um, and the other thing that we've discovered uh, in our research is that let's say that you want to, as an organization, offer a workshop. And um, so what we did is we had these participants kind of rate their level of interest in participating in the workshop. And in one condition, we called it a happiness workshop, happiness yeah. and well-being workshop. And in the other condition, we called it a satisfaction, engagement, and morale workshop. And we just asked them, you know, how keen are you to enroll yourself in the workshop? 
how willing would you be to participate in it and so on. And there was just an overwhelming majority who preferred the happiness workshop to the engagement moral satisfaction workshop. And it could very well be that happiness is a newer topic than those things. But when we actually asked these people why is it that they were more interested in the happiness workshop, they said that well when the organization organizes a happiness workshop for us, then it, um, it signals to us that they really truly care about what deeply truly personally matters to us. But if it's engagement and you know morale and, and satisfaction, it seems like they want to enhance those so that they can make more profits. Right. So it's more for the organization than it is perhaps for me. Okay. You know? So yeah. Yeah, that's a brilliant point. Mm -hmm. So um, the the why now question, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, what's going on in the corporate space. So you have uh, we've just come out of the pandemic and we are seeing enormous volatility in business and with AI just around the corner. Mm -hmm. Every conversation we have with organizations around AI. There is an underlying fear, mm -hmm. right? There is uh, some amount of elevated stress that yeah. we are. So it, it's not about just training people on Gen AI and technologies. The the conversation is more about how do I prepare people for that, right? Yeah. So I, I think that the theme here is happiness in the uh, in the times of crisis mm -hmm. or some kind of a, an external shock like this, right? Uh, how do organizations manage to stay the course on happiness when all of these things are happening in the environment? You know, it's kind of interesting. I don't think there's ever been a time at which people say that this is not a stressed out time. Yeah. You know, uh, earlier it was COVID and before that God knows what, right? The internet perhaps. Um, so it always feels, and there's a name for this by the way, it's called the immediacy bias, yeah. okay? So I don't know if you kind of, you can relate to this, but you might see a movie or go on a vacation and then you're just overwhelmed by the quality of the movie and you say, this is the best movie I've ever seen. Right? This is the best vacation that I've ever, ever been to. Or this is the most stressed out that I'm feeling. And so there is this tendency to kind of think that the present moment is more extreme than it's ever been in the past. So uh, in other words, you know, objectively speaking, I'm not so sure that this particular time is even more stressful or even more uncertain. VUCA, have you guys heard of that expression, right? Yeah. Yeah, more volatile and uncertain and uh, I don't forget, chaotic, I guess. Chaotic, and ambiguous. Then, yeah, ambiguous than it's ever been. Um, but, you know, back to the question, so what do you do to kind of stay on course, right? So at the end of the day, if you kind of strip uh, this topic of happiness down to really the bare essentials, it turns out we really don't need a whole lot to be happy, you know? Uh, you need your basic needs to be fulfilled, right? You need food, clothing, shelter, etc., uh, for you to be happy, and it makes sense, right? Um, if you're not sure where your next meal is going to come from or you know you don't have adequate medical attention to pressing needs uh, you're not going to be happy right basic needs are very important then we need to have a sense of belonging we need a good healthy social life right you need at least one really really good friend right somebody that you can call upon uh, if you have an emergency and you have no doubt that they would you know jump to your rescue right uh, they might curse you, but they would, you know, come to your rescue. Uh, you need at least one. And it turns out that even that is a little bit of a tall order for some people in the U.S., unfortunately, uh, now, especially for men over 50. Um, you know, the loneliness epidemic in the United States is, like, really, really stunning. You know, we talk a lot about the kind of digital generation and the digital natives and millennials and how anxious they are because of, you know, spending so much time on social media. but. Really, I mean, there is a, a, another segment of people who are, who are having a huge problem, which is the 50 plus males uh, in the US. They've invested so much time and effort in work um, that, you know, and many of them are divorced now, and their kids are now not as connected to their parents as the previous generation kids used to be because of the kind of like, you know, uh, time spent they spend on social media, et cetera. Um, so that, Loneliness epidemic is huge. So even though it might sound like a simple thing, and I think that we are lucky in India to have a much better social life, uh, you know, perhaps because of something that seems like a constraint and unwelcome thing, which is that we are huddled together in smaller spaces and uh, all that. We don't have like a separate bedroom for every child, etc. But it's actually a good thing that that's that's the case. Anyway, so we need at least one really good friend. So basic needs first. One at least really good friend. Ideally, your spouse, but you know, typically it turns out it's the same gender person who's your best friend. Um, and then you need a sense of autonomy or control. You need a, 
to feel that, look, and if I want to do something, by and large, I can do it, right? If I want to eat a nice meal, I can do it. I have the resources to do it. So money comes into the picture. Um, and people in democracies where we have more freedom tend to be happier than people in autocracies because of this you know, uh, desire for control or desire for autonomy, as it's called. So basic needs, belonging, some sense of control, autonomy. And then you need to have something that you do uh, with your time that seems engaging, that seems intrinsically interesting to you, right? So, and you know, we spend a lot of time at work, right? And so if you do not enjoy what you do for work, then it's a, bit, it's a big shame. So ideally, you want something that you work for that you actually find to be somewhat interesting. And if you have these things, so I call these the MBA goals, right? Mastery, you need to feel like you're progressing toward doing something better and better, uh, something that you find engaging. Uh, B for belonging or social life and then A for autonomy. So if you have an MBA, you're happy kind of a thing. Um, so basic needs first, that's the foundation, right? Without it, forget about happiness uh, and then MBA. So, you know, I don't think that this is too much to ask for, really. You know, if you have like sufficient access to resources, you're making enough money to make your ends meet and a little bit more for doing the things you want to do and you have a good social life. That's the thing that I think that we need to really be careful about and invest a lot of time and resources in. Um, it's very easy to get distracted by work and then sacrifice your friendships. Uh, and then later on you discover that that was a bad thing to do. You burnt a bridge, right? So if you have those, then really, I mean, you can be happy. And so what this means is that there may be a lot of chaos. There may be a lot of uncertainty. All of those things are coming down the pike. But really kind of like, you know, take a deep breath, close your eyes and refocus on, okay, do I have these things? Do I have access to basic needs? Do I have a sense of autonomy? Do I have a sense of progressing towards something um, that I want to be a good at? I want to be good at. Do I have some level of autonomy and control, right? If you kind of keep reminding yourself that all of this is there, right? And sometimes it becomes difficult because we kind of bite off more than we can chew, right? We want to take on challenges that are really going to expand us or make us learn or grow in ways that we want to and, and we might end up kind of burning the candle at both ends, right? So then you don't have the sense of autonomy, you don't have the sense of you know, inner peace, right? Um, and that could be the problem. Or it could be, that, like I said, you know, that you've burnt up your uh, relationship bridges, right? Or you're in a job that you're not progressing toward mastery in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a domain in which you do want to become skilled. So you do not like what you do for work, right? So I don't think any of you is suffering from lack of basic needs, as far as I can tell, okay? You all look well fed and you know, healthy. Um, so it's really gonna be one of those other three things that are uh, probably the problem. And so if you just kind of like you know, refocus on that, I think it's gonna be okay, you know? Okay, so the one key word that came to my mind as I uh, listened to you just now is the word balance. Mm -hmm. right? There are these different determinants of happiness, but somewhere it seems like we need to find our own mm. balance in all of this, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we over index on one dimension mm -hmm. and then we realize oh my god, I, I missed out on something else. Mm -hmm. uh, does that make sense, you know, finding our own sense of balance? Yeah, another way to put it might be that, you know, you need a critical level on each of these three factors to be fulfilled, right? So if you have a lot of progression toward mastery, you know, you're really, really good at what you do and you're consumed by work and there's no doubt that you're the industry expert or whatever, everyone's kind of acknowledging that, but you let your family life you know, down and, and you're not there for your family or, you know, uh, you don't really have social life, uh, a healthy social life, uh, that can obviously be a problem, right? So you need at least a critical level on each of these. So in that sense, I do think that you need to kind of balance it out a little okay. bit. Okay, yeah. got it. And uh, coming back to the corporate context again, right? So any examples that you can think of where a company used happiness as a driver for innovation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's this famous example of Zappos. I don't know if you've heard yeah. of, yeah, so Tony Shea, who unfortunately died you know, a couple of years ago, uh, he wrote a really great book called Delivering Happiness. And the whole company and organization, the, the whole motto was, let's enhance the happiness of everybody, beginning with our employees, right? And um, so one of the interesting things that they did was that they would recruit people, right? And they would try their best to recruit people who really valued happiness and valued having fun, et cetera, right? So they kind of like were aligned in terms of the recruitment practices with their vision, right, which is to create this happy company. And then immediately after recruiting people, they would offer the person, this was back like 20 years ago, uh, $2,000 to quit within a week. So imagine that you get, got the job with Zappos, right, and in your offer letter is this thing that, hey, if you quit in the next week, we'll give you $2,000. 
<laughs> right? And the idea was that if somebody is so money minded that the money is more important to them than working for Zappos, right? We don't want you. Okay, I think it was a brilliant move. I mean, not too many people quit because they've done their due diligence in terms of recruiting the right kind of people. But it sent this clear message that, look, we do not want people who are really money-minded and kind of, you know, that's your, what you're after. That's what you value. We want people who are really, you know, uh, happiness-oriented. And so they would do a bunch of things that uh, were very interesting, but all uh, focused on making not just the employees happy, but also the customers happy. So, for example, the other thing that they did is when you called Zappos, um, it went directly to a person. Uh, there's no automated kind of, you know, uh, system there. I don't know this day of AI, et cetera, if it's even feasible. And perhaps, you know, it might even be actually cheaper and possible to um, have something that sounds like a real human being, right? Um, so, you know, I don't know how uh, that idea would translate in this day and age, but 20 years ago, uh, they would actually have somebody, and they spent a lot of money for, you know, for this. Um, so, the actual human being would speak to them. And from Tony's perspective, it was, you know, if we can actually talk to the customer and find out what their problems are, this is an opportunity for us to fix things uh, rather than treat it as a kind of cost thing, right? So, this is a, actually a good thing that we are able to kind of talk to the customer directly. So they did a bunch of things that uh, were all centered around enhancing happiness. So they're very focused on happiness. Awesome. That's a great example. I wonder if it remains the same after Amazon's Amazon, acquisition yeah, yeah, of yeah, Zappos. Yeah. Um, so one of the realities today is that we have a distributed workforce working hybrid, remote, yeah, virtual. Yeah. What sort of complexities do you see uh, now with companies trying to make uh, their employees happy or engaged. Mm -hmm. uh, any tips or tricks that you've seen companies implement to get this right? Yeah, it's a great question. Earlier you said something about, you know, people want flexibility yeah. and that's so true, right? Uh, and flexibility is about autonomy and people want autonomy, especially the newer generation. I think that's really, you know, the millennials are very focused on doing something that they truly want to do and I think that meaning is much more important for this new generation than is necessarily money. So flexibility becomes important and then because of COVID, I think the uh, dimension on which people want a lot of flexibility is like uh, where do they work from, right? Do they work from home? Do they work from here? And companies are struggling with figuring out, you know, what's the right balance there, you know, talking about balance again, yeah. right? Uh, and what the research is suggesting there is that I don't think that there is one solution that is uh, best for every company in every situation. Um, and so what's very important is that the employees are consulted uh, in terms of whatever policy that you eventually end up with, whether it be, okay, you know, we are definitely going to work from uh, the office and everybody needs to come in all five days of the week or all six days, um, or it could be the other extreme, right? And most organizations have taken the hybrid approach, uh, which is to say that you need to come in for some days and not for other days. Um, and um, what's interesting is that whatever policy that you have in the end is not quite as important as getting the employees buy in on the policy and on top of it the communication of the policy and the rationale for why it is that you have the policy very explicitly and upfront before you end up with the policy. And so it's more about the communication part of it rather than what the uh, policy is that seems to be more important, which I, th which I thought was um, both intuitive and at the same time, um, perhaps not quite, you know, something that people would have thought would be the case up front, right? I mean, I think it's tempting to decide that, okay, you know, a hybrid policy is best where you come in three days a week, but two days a week you're free to work from home or the other, you know, any other kind of a policy. But really it's more about the communication and getting the employees be part of the process by which you arrive at the uh, policy. That seems to be more important. Got it. So one of the things that I've just to build on that, right, um, the challenge seems to be that the Maslow's hierarchy that you are referencing, mm -hmm. the basic needs and all mm -hmm. of that, there seems to be because of the multi-gen workforce we have, mm -hmm. that hierarchy doesn't look the same for mm -hmm. all generations, mm -hmm. right? So how do you get this communication right mm -hmm. in terms of what is the need of mm -hmm. one segment of your uh, uh, you know, employees versus the other? There seems to be a challenge around that, mm -hmm. right, because the needs have shifted over time. Yeah, I don't know if the needs have shifted. I think that the younger generation, this is kind of neat video that was going around a while ago. I'm trying to kind of remember the details of it, but you know, I, like if you look at my father's generation, right? 
they basically stuck to one job. My father was in the Indian Railways for 40 years or something, okay. And our generation, and I'm going to kind of, you know, bucket sure. us together if you don't mind. Um, I think we kind of might move around a little bit, um, but we were focused too on this idea of kind of building a career for ourselves. My parents' generation, I think, was more about let's make sure that there's food on the table, right? The basic needs. And we have kind of like, you know, taken basic needs for granted a little bit, um, at least in the upper middle class families when I was growing up, into focusing more on, you know, perhaps kind of achievement and things like that. But the younger generation, from my understanding, they're much more focused on, kind of, I want to do something that's aligned with who I believe to be or what my values are or what I find to be meaningful. So, uh, it's not as if the Maslow's hierarchy has changed, but rather I think that things that are lower down in the hierarchy are taken for granted or are assumed to be fulfilled and there's no danger that any of those uh, things are going to go away, right? So they have the luxury of focusing on something that's higher up, right? And I think that as leaders we need to, you know, um, recognize that and uh, speak to them in the language that you know, uh, appeals to them. And therefore, if you talk about things like, hey, if you come to Nolscape, you know, you're going to be um, paid enough money to, you know, put <laughs> food on your table is not going to be appealing to them. I think you're going to be, have to speak to them at the level of, okay, what, um, what is the kind of meaning that they want? And so speak to them in terms of, okay, what is the role that you're going to play and how is it going to make a difference to the world? Those kinds of things, you know, <laughs> that I see here, yeah. uh, perhaps, you know, uh, are going to be more appealing to them. Right. So, just building on that, I, I find this topic very fascinating, right? So, um, building on what you just said about the previous generation where they were focusing on the basics, maybe they did not have the mental space to think about happiness. Am I happy? Yeah. Yeah. They, were, they yeah. were just busy mm -hmm. doing uh, what needed to be done. Mm -hmm. But now that the, the hierarchy is, sh I mean, we're shifting up in the hierarchy, now we have the time and space to think about these existential issues. Yeah. Who am I? What am I doing here? Yeah. Am I happy? Yeah. Maybe those questions were not relevant or you didn't even think about those. Yeah. Is, is that making sense? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that one of the big reasons why there is such a huge interest in the topic of happiness is because if you rewound about, you know, even a hundred years ago, right, um, the only people that could kind of afford to think about these topics, who had the luxury of thinking about these topics were perhaps the kings and the queens and, you know, the kind of elite class, right? Uh, but what's happened in the last hundred years is that a lot of us have been catapulted into a socio-economic category in which uh, we are living the lives of the kings and queens of the past. In fact, even better, right? I mean, yeah. they didn't have air conditioning. They couldn't like, you know, eat any fruit from anywhere in the world at any, you know, any day, any day of the week, right? So we can do all of those things. And so there's a migration of a bunch of people who were below a level of basic needs uh, being fulfilled and therefore didn't have the bandwidth to think about happiness to a large, you know, maybe about even close to a billion people around the world now yeah. who are above that cutoff. And uh, so, you know, and once you get there, that's when you realize, hey, you know, just fulfilling a basic need doesn't quite cut it in terms of happiness, doesn't make me happy. What else do I need? And then, you know, you look at the research and all these things come to the fore, right? You need a good social life. You need a sense of kind of, you know, progression towards something that you're increasingly skilled at and you're competent at, you know, what I call mastery. You need the sense of autonomy. Um, and then even after those, you end up discovering that it doesn't quite, you know, make you happy all the time. And so you have to then work on creating this mindset, right? Um, and earlier, uh, you, you talked a little bit about this. I'm trying to kind of recall exactly what you said, but you, you said that uh, once you feel complete, mm -hmm. right? I think that's the word you used. Yeah. Uh, that's very, very important. And, and you kind of arrive at that point where you discover that, hey, it's more of an inside job, right? Sure, I mean, you know, access to basic needs is important. Feeling like you're doing something meaningful for work is important. Social life is important. All those things are external to you. Those are important. But even with those things, it's not guaranteed that you're going to be happy. And so you need to really arrive at a mindset or a point where you feel like complete. And I call this the abundance mindset, yeah. right? And kind of circling back to the very first question, right? CHROs. I would grant the CHROs happiness, but really what that means is I would grant them an abundance mindset because you cannot be happy in a sustained basis unless you operate from this mindset that, hey, I have everything that I need. And truly, if you look at our lives, right, I can definitely speak for myself and I imagine that, you know, you can all kind of, you know, uh, you'll agree with me that this characterizes your life circumstance as well. You know, you can afford to feel abundant. You can afford to feel that I have everything that I need 
for me to be happy right now. Okay, uh, Ronald Reagan said this in a totally different context, but he said, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? Now, if you're waiting for happiness to happen later, it's probably not going to happen because everything that you need to be happy is right now, right here, right? If your basic needs are fulfilled and if you have a decent job, if you have at least one good relationship, if you have a sense of autonomy, this is it, right? Uh, you really have to look at your glass and say it's half full, right? Rather than think of it as half empty. That's what the abundance mindset is. That what that does is that if you feel abundant, if you feel like I have more than enough, right? I have everything that I need to be happy. It makes you other focused. It makes you more focused on things that are, to do that are intrinsically interesting for you rather than going after the money or the fame or the power because you have enough. You feel complete. It makes you feel like I don't need everything to work out exactly the way that I want it to work out for me to be happy. I can be happy regardless of what happens outside of me, right? So you feel all of these things. Um, so your pursuit of mastery is no longer going to be about comparing yourself to other people. Uh, it's going to be more about what do I like to do, right? Your pursuit of belonging and connections is not going to be how can other people love me? How can other people, you know, put me at the, uh, in, the, in the spotlight? It'd be more about how can I help other people, right? Your pursuit of autonomy is not going to be, okay, how can I control things? How can I get everything to work out like I want it to? Rather, it would be about how can I be happy inside of my own head, even if things don't work out, right? You're, so you gain internal autonomy as opposed to external autonomy. I don't know if I'm making sense, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm kind of going through things relatively fast here. But basically, the abundance mindset is the center of the center uh, in terms of identity. If you think of yourself as my identity is that I'm abundance oriented, then everything else follows. Your processes follow, your outcomes will follow. And it's actually a win-win. You know, you might be somewhat worried that if I operate from abundance, is it going to come at a cost to my success? Is it going to come at a cost to my productivity? No, it won't. Uh, in this day and age, it's super important that you operate from abundance. People can sense it. People like you better. You're going to be more chill, right? You're going to focus on the things that you really want to do. You're going to progress faster toward mastery and acquiring skills than if you were, you know, comparing yourself to other people and wanting to be better than them. That's what a scarcity minded person does, right? So it's actually one of these beautiful things where, you know, there's really no cost uh, or no downside to acquiring or adopting, I should say, an abundance mindset. And if you kind of strive to do that, then, you know, and there's ways in which there are processes that you can put in place in order to get there. And one of the kind of, you know, uh, important things to do there is to remind yourself that your life is good on a daily basis. Every evening before you go to sleep, write three good things that happened to you. Non-egotistical good things, right? Not things that you achieved, not things that you worked for, but things that the universe granted you, even though you did not, you know, do anything to get it. So it might be things, small things like, hey, I thought I lost my glasses and they were like, you know, under my couch, and I just discovered it today, right? Um, so little things like that, uh, things that make you feel lucky, basically. If you just note those things on an everyday basis, slowly but surely, over a period of time, your kind of unconscious mind is going to um, feel that life is good, and the universe takes care of me. There are a lot of things that are happening to me that I don't even deserve, I did not work for, but they're all being granted to me. And so once that shift happens, then you become more abundance oriented uh, from the inside out and people notice it, people can see it, people can see you smile more, people can see you be just more generous to other people and so on, then it just sets in place a kind of a domino effect, um, a kind of a virtuous upward <laughs> spiraling cycle so to speak. That was brilliant, I think the penny dropped for me because the way you connected abundance to completeness, yeah. that idea was not formed in my head, thanks mm -hmm. for bringing that up. One final question from my end and I'll open this up for an AMA. Uh, the shift that happened in my mind is uh, back in the day when I was a lot younger, uh, there were happy people and there were not so happy people. So you, you're tempted to think that maybe this is genetic, right? The, the outlook, mm -hmm. there are genuinely you look around, there are some people who are yeah. naturally happy and there are others come what may are not happy, right? They, you can't make them happy. Then it shifted a little bit when I became uh, more aware, I suppose. There are happy days that happen to me, there are not so happy days and there are in between May, something mm -hmm. happened, right? Mm -hmm. So life gives you, it's a box of chocolates, right? You don't know what you're getting. And then it shifts even further uh, when you say that, um, you know, it's, it's something within, irrespective of the circumstances outside, it is in fact a skill. Mm -hmm. It's not a state of mind, it is not genetic, it is actually a skill. 
when that idea came to me i felt empowered because we are all in the learning profession if it is a skill like fitness like anything else you should be able to learn it yeah and you also you are also told that it's a choice yeah then the thing is are you choosing to learn or mm-hmm. not which <laughs> brings us back to our mission and all of that that was an empowering thought for me yeah. Yeah. so what does one do to learn happiness as a skill mm-hmm. right and how do you exercise that choice day in day out any any tips that you personally use i have a brilliant <laughs> tip okay yeah. buy my book <laughs> and read it <laughs> okay well, jokes apart um but i mean i do seriously mean that though because that's what that book is about yeah. you know it, it covers all of this um uh, happiness is the loftiest goal there is you know it's more complicated than winning the lo- winning the olympic uh, winning an olympic gold medal or getting a good grade in a class this is why the buddha famously left his kingdom you know aristotle kind of put happiness as the chief goal you know it's what we all aspire for um and in a sense i guess you know it 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 deservingly is complicated and um you know uh, complex so if i were to break it down again you know if you look at these basic needs and mastery and you know all of these things um really i mean if you aspire to acquire an abundance mindset i think that should be front and center um and you know that is the skill that you want uh, you know it doesn't sound like a skill but it is to be in a space in which you're looking at things from the perspective of somebody who's abundance minded right at at every point in time if you can do that then i think that you'll have clarity on what that means because your your identity is one of an abundance minded person so the then the processes you know so what would you choose to do in a situation becomes a little bit clearer okay you choose the thing that is consistent with being abundance minded so in the end you know basically what it translates into is that you need to have a bunch of healthy habits or happiness enhancing habits so that begins with i think the foundational practice is um you know leading a healthy lifestyle there is just no way that you can be happy without eating well exercising sleeping well i know that i'm sleep deprived <laughs> so right now you know uh it's not something that i'm checking off uh, in the past week but uh that is super important i mean without having a healthy lifestyle forget about happiness you need to feel like your cells are oozing happiness you know um to aspire to happiness in your head when your body is not when you at a cellular level happy it's going to be very difficult okay so you do invest a lot of time and effort into that okay and i do think that this day and age it's a little bit easier to do it than was the case before because we have a lot of opportunities to go to the gym um we have a lot of knowledge about what it takes to get a good night sleep we have a lot of knowledge about diet right in general processed food is not good the indian diet is bad guys i mean i'm sorry to say that i mean it's tasty no doubt it's too carb heavy you know it's just too carb heavy and too fiber low on fiber um and that needs to kind of like change you know and it takes a little bit of time to kind of acquire that new taste and move away from eating dosa idli sambar vada you know for breakfast and then uh and dal makhani for dinner so right so um that's foundational and then like i said you know focus on relationship relationships are super important uh i'm sure that you guys have seen that ted talk if you haven't i would i would highly recommend it it's by a guy called robert waldinger um who pursued or or you know it's it's been it's a 100 year study right so he's the latest director uh part of a research team uh and probably third or the fourth kind of research team that has been tracking these individuals mm-hmm. over like 100 years and they discover that the single biggest determinant of your longevity right actual physical kind of uh, uh, how long you live as well as your happiness or you know low psychological stress is the quality of your relationships so the people who actually had diseases right heart problems or even cancer uh, kidney problems etc they lived less than people who had those problems but had a good social life it's mind boggling you know so you could have a physical ailment but if you have a healthy social life you're going to live longer right and report higher levels of happiness so um social life prioritizing that is super important uh, so at least one vacation with your friends every single year for example right and you know set up some time to hang out with your family uh, without any digital devices and so on anyway i don't want to kind of go too deep into it but really i mean you know it's a bunch of things that you would do to acquire the skill right So if you think about mathematics if you want to kind of acquire the skill of mathematics what do you do you know you sit down and uh, read a book or you know take classes and and work out problems by yourself and so on 
this is why happiness is a lofty goal because just that one thing for improving math won't quite cut it for happiness. You need relationships, you need um, you know good physical health uh, and lifestyle and you need to achieve a sense of autonomy and really at the end of the day what that translates into is achieving internal autonomy. So no matter the weather outside, the weather in my head is always beautiful. You know, so you want to kind of arrive there, which means that you got to be at some level good at meditation, really. I mean, you know, mindfulness, uh, which is really the ability to focus on the things that you want to focus on and not focus on the things that you do not want to focus on. It's a superpower. You know, if you have that, you can compartmentalize, you can forget about the past email that got you angry, focus on the next presentation or whatever's coming up. You can fall asleep very well and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, so internal autonomy, uh, identifying what it is that you want to be good at and progressing toward mastery, that becomes important, etc. Awesome. Uh, Bottom yeah. line, read his book. <laughs> uh, cool. On that note, I um, would lo love to wrap this up. Dr. Raj, it was awesome having this chat with you. Uh, I wish we could go on and on, but um, really appreciate your presence here and all your valuable insights. Thank you so much for doing this for us. Thank you. Thank you very much.